W5. Sometimes I sit and I hear the children's crying. A remote highway, a terrible tragedy, and a driver's remorse. And he told me that he made a big mistake. This is gonna keep happening. There's gonna be another one. I'm so sorry for the pain I have caused you because it was my mistake. And a desperate family's journey through a deadly humanitarian crisis. That's the time when kids were about to die. It's gonna be very difficult to try to coordinate anything. We're now at the point where if they don't get out, I'm good. Here is Avery Haynes. Welcome. We begin our 56th season with a story of profound grief, extraordinary forgiveness, and a demand for change. In a television exclusive, the truck driver convicted in one of this country's worst collisions is speaking out. It's a public apology to Canada. And three years after the Humboldt Broncos tragedy, our investigation reveals deep, potentially deadly flaws in truck driver training programs, with insiders fearful it could happen again. On these flat Alberta roads, Tanvir Mann has been doing a lot of soul searching. I'm doing okay. I'm working hard. It's a difficult period of our life. We were dreaming of having a better future in Canada. In 2013, at the age of 22, Tanvir left India and came to Canada on a student visa. Her boyfriend came the following year, both of them armed with degrees, hers in nursing, his in commerce. We were studying and we were doing part-time jobs. We were trying to save some money for our higher education. We were building our future slowly. A future that looked so promising when they briefly returned to India for their fairy tale wedding in 2018. Three years later, Tanvir never imagined she'd be visiting her new husband in a Canadian prison. I couldn't even believe that this happened. It was a nightmare to be in that situation and everybody involved. It was a total disaster. Tanvir's husband is Jaskirat Sidhu, a man forever etched in the minds of Canadians as the humbled driver. On April 6, 2018, he caused the collision that killed 16 members of the Humboldt Hockey Club, injured 13 others, and plunged an entire nation into mourning. Can you take me back mm -hmm. to that moment when you learned what had happened? I was just told that he's in an accident. He's in a very bad accident. This word bad, it broke me. I just, I just knew that my life turned upside down. He was crying. I was crying. He told me that there is a big loss. And he told me that he made a big mistake. W5 traveled to Bowdoin, Alberta for Jaskirat Sidhu's first ever television interview. Because of COVID, it was via video from a town near the Bowdoin Institution, where Sidhu has just recently been transferred from medium to minimum security. So this is the camera, uh, okay. Because of ongoing civil litigation, this interview was allowed on the condition that no questions be asked about the trucking industry or training. Over the course of an hour and a half, Jaskirat Sidhu answered almost every question with an apology first. I'm so sorry for the pain I have caused you because it was my mistake. And that pain, I regret every day that my actions how I can do that to them. 
seeing them every day in my dreams and losing their kids, losing their life partners, losing their brother and sister, lose the most valuable things of their life. And that happened because of me. You saw more of that tragedy than anyone else on earth. What are the images that you can't erase from your mind? Sometimes I sit and I hear the children's crying and I see all the, all the devastated pictures in my mind and uh, people are rushing, firefighters, all the first responders are helping everybody. This recreation shows Jaskirat Sidhu hauling a 45,000 kilo load heading west towards Armley's Corner in Saskatchewan. He says he was looking in the rearview mirrors to check the tarps on his double tractor trailer. He didn't see a stop sign with a blinking red light and didn't slow down. A bus carrying the Humboldt Hockey Club was at that same moment traveling north towards the intersection and despite 24 meters of braking, couldn't stop in time. When you think back on that day, when did it hit you, the devastation that had been caused? It happened so quickly. Suddenly it shook me and I, I was frozen for, for some time. How do you live with yourself knowing that 16 people are dead and so many families changed forever? It's the pain that I have caused to so many families, to this country, to the people who love hockey. I had never wanted to hurt anybody in my whole life and certainly this thing came into my life. He's facing 29 charges in that fatal collision in Saskatchewan. 16 counts of dangerous driving causing death, 13 counts of dangerous driving causing bodily harm. There was no trial. Jaskirat Sidhu waived any defense and pleaded guilty to all charges. The sentencing hearing was so crowded with victims' families that it had to be moved to this community center in Melford, Saskatchewan. Over four agonizing days, 90 victim impact statements were delivered. The judge handed down a sentence of eight years behind bars. Canadians were gripped by the individual stories of loss. What was it like for you to hear those stories and to learn about the people whose lives were no more? It happened because of me and it's a human life. It's not one or two, it's 16. And definitely when I get to know if their kids, their, their hockey team and the love this country has for hockey and how devastated they are, how broken they are with this, it, it gives me an extra burden of hurting every single person in this country. Scott Thomas was among those who delivered a victim impact statement. Scott and Lori's son, Evan, was one of the 16 victims. There's a huge hole in my heart. Just that lost opportunity. One of the things we had him do at the funeral home was take his handprint and ink. And then we found his kindergarten handprint. And Scott always says he put that on there so that for every time he shakes people's hands, Evan will be shaking someone's hand too. Their entire home is blanketed with reminders of Evan. For both, some semblance of healing has come through forgiveness. While the country watched Jaskirat Sidhu leave court each day, a visibly broken man, no one knew about a powerful moment that had happened inside the courthouse. We just had a feeling that uh, Evan would want us to let him know that we were forgiven him. And that night I had a pen in around my neck and was was having trouble breathing. And I'm like, man, I just got to take this off. So um, we said we should give this to Sidhu and write him a letter. You give this pendant and this letter to Mr. Sidhu's lawyer. And an opportunity arises for you to actually go in and be with him and meet him. When I turned around to shake his hand, he was down on his knee and grasped both my hands and was bawling like a baby. And so I just picked him up and hugged him and we stood like that for, felt like forever. I was shivering and I was in a fear to face somebody 
whose kid, kid has died because of me and what will I talk to them? What will I say to them? I felt like I was hugging my son, really. It was like a father, I picked him up and part of me was like, you know he made a horrible mistake. And he knew that, you could tell he knew that. I was just broken, I was just kneeling down in front of him and he cried, both of us cried. And, and I said, I don't know what happened and I'm sorry about that I have caused you this pain. And I asked him if, if I can do anything for you. He said, no, you tell me if I, if I can do anything for you. So those things, those words are everything to me. How can a person who has just lost his son ask me if he can do something for me? And we stepped away and he unbuttoned his shirt and showed me Evan's pendant. And... Do you know that he won't wear that in jail because he wants to keep it pure? So it's kept at, at home with his wife. I didn't know that. Can't imagine a man like that being in a place with rapists and murderers and, and there's just gotta be some, some other, something else we can do, but. Scott and Lori may have forgiven the man. They have not forgiven the industry that put him behind the wheel that day. It's Jazz Scott's part-time job. It wasn't what he wanted to do. It's an embarrassment that he was allowed to do that. So then you just realize, holy cow, like Jazz Kratz to do is just the head of the snake. This is way bigger than just one driver. There's gonna be more of these unless the Messy. people that employ these guys are held to a higher standard. This is gonna keep happening. There's gonna be another one. Oh yeah, until we make changes. And nothing's really changed three years later. Coming up, our number one consideration, the safety to Canadians. Trying to prevent another tragedy. These guys are driving loaded weapons on our public roadways. When W5 continues. This is Jaskirat Sidhu celebrating his 29th birthday at home in Calgary with his wife Tanvir. Six months later, Jaskirat got behind the wheel of a big rig and ran a stop sign, colliding with a bus carrying the Humboldt Broncos Hockey Club, killing 16 and injuring 13 others. He has become the face of an industry with fatal flaws. Kim Richardson and Mike Millian have spent decades on Canadian highways. They're now trucking consultants and trainers, speaking out about industry challenges at a truck stop in southwestern Ontario. What have you come away with when it comes to the kind of training that Mr. Sidhu had? Unacceptable. We have a, a responsibility to society as an industry to ensure that the people that get behind the wheels of these tractor trailers are competent, are qualified. Jaskirat Sidhu had no professional driving experience. He took a one week course to get his class one license. For two weeks, he had another driver with him on the road. The collision happened on one of his first solo long haul trips, driving a double transport trailer with a tarped load on unfamiliar roads. I was scared, I was scared. It's not easy to drive that many hours where you don't see even a town or city for so many kilometers on the road. While Jaskirat was sentenced to eight years in prison, the company that put him on the road, Adesh Diol, received just a $5,000 fine for multiple safety violations and was immediately shut down. But 10 days later, reports surfaced that the owner was recruiting drivers under a new name it too was shut down. Mike Millian is the president of the Private Motor Truck Council of Canada. In the aftermath of the Humboldt tragedy, there was a lot of soul searching about your industry. There was a lot of fanfare about changes that were going to be made. Have the changes that were announced mitigated the possibility of another Humboldt? Um, no. No. We're not close. Not even close? No. Changes have 
been made, we're just touching the tip of the iceberg. Nine months after the tragedy, then Federal Transport Minister Mark Garneau announced a new national training standard. It is very, very clear to us that people who receive their license as, uh, as drivers of uh, semi-trailers and large vehicles uh, should be properly prepared through training. But that's created its own set of problems. In Ontario, one of the provinces that embraced standardized entry-level training, the move has triggered an explosion in truck driving training schools with a shocking lack of oversight. We now have more training schools in the province of Ontario than in the history of our industry. Does it concern you that some of those schools are pumping out students who should not be on the roads? 100%, 100%. When we got into business in 1989, there was four schools in the province of Ontario. Now there are 155. And a W-5 investigation reveals there are just eight inspectors, not just for truck driving schools, but for every single private college in the province. More than 700 campuses offering courses in everything from truck driving to aesthetics. Kim Richardson is the president of the Truck Training Schools Association of Ontario. The same inspectors that go in to look at truck training schools are the same investigators that go in to look at welding schools or hairdressing schools, and their bandwidth and their capacity is, is stretched. So you create rules and regulations, but if nobody's going to enforce them, only those that want to follow them will follow them. This is a truck yard in North Toronto. Avi Yanko has been running s and Sprint Driving School since 1989. With certified teachers and a five to 10 week program, his is one of the legitimate schools. Even so, Avi says he's only been inspected just once on the day he opened 32 years ago. There are real concerns that no one is checking schools like yours and the fly-by-night ones to make sure that the people who are in that truck know what they're doing and are safe. How many people come to make sure that this school is putting out students properly? They, they come in when you're opening and this is it. They only come when you open? Yeah, and this is it, yeah. So you've never had inspectors never here? Never after that, no. But th that's a problem. Yep. And that national strategy that was announced, well, it has gaping holes three years after the Humboldt tragedy. That's because trucking is provincially regulated. And while some provinces have mandated a bare minimum in training, other provinces already have training that's actually more robust. But this is key, it's optional so they've been slow to sign on to the lower but mandatory federal standards. The result, there are still some drivers behind the wheel in this country with no formal training. They've simply passed a test. In most of Canada, you can do that at just 18 years of age. These guys are driving loaded weapons on our public roadways, places that my 17-year-old daughter learned to drive. Scott and Lori Thomas lost their son Evan in the Humboldt tragedy. Scott says there's one simple solution. It needs to be federally regulated. Our truck drivers need to be educated and regulated like their trades, like their electricians and plumbers, airport pilots. They need that level of expertise because there needs to be a higher level of accountability there and it just, it's not there yet. W5 contacted then Federal Transport Minister Mark Garneau to ask him if he thought the national training standard he announced back in 2019 had been successful. We also asked why truck driving wasn't federally regulated, like pilots and train engineers. He did not respond to those questions. While the industry grapples with how to make the highways safer, Jaskirat Sidhu is facing a new legal battle, deportation. As a permanent resident convicted of a serious crime, Canada could send Jaskirat back to India. It shouldn't be one strike you're out. That's not Canadian. Calgary lawyer Michael Green recently submitted legal arguments for why Jaskirat Sidhu should not be deported. You've been doing this for three decades. What do you think the chances are that Mr. Sidhu will be allowed to stay in Canada? This has got to be one of the most difficult cases because it's not clear cut. Normally you get a really serious offense, it's easy for them to say bye bye. In this case, it's when you've got a crime of inadvertence, you've got somebody with an unblemished record and who is well established in Canada, has a bright future. There's another factor too, which is his wife. They had this dream together. While he's pretty broken, it's hard for him to fight for himself. 
He's not just fighting for himself. He's asking for a second chance for his wife too. This 415 page binder lays out the argument against deportation. Extreme level of remorse, no criminal history, no drugs, alcohol, excessive speed or pattern of reckless driving, low risk to reoffend, and no desire to ever re-enter the trucking industry. In addition, hundreds of letters of public support have been included in the file. There are people out there who support him, who write him letters. I'm very thankful to them. He gets these letters on a weekly basis. People from all over the world, actually. But those letters may not carry as much weight in the deportation process as the sentiments of some humbled family members, including the fathers of Jackson Joseph and Adam Harold, who have spoken out in local media. Our pain is going to be here forever. We have a life sentence. But if we can get the laws to get him deported, that's one little thing that we don't have to worry about ever again. We don't have to see him in the news. We don't have to go through that. Our family is, is broken forever because of him. And uh, it, I think it, it's the way to heal is, is he's got to be out of our sight. And this is where the once unified grief amongst Humboldt families has begun to fray. Scott and Lori have decided to fight for the man who caused the death of their son. We sent some letters to his lawyer saying that our family doesn't think that he needs to be deported, that that, that, that needs to be the necessary conclusion to how this all ends. To me, it's extraordinary that not, on, not only have you forgiven Jasker, but you're actively working to keep him in Canada. Why? He just got married. He took that job to help his wife go back to school. And they were making a life in Canada. And then that happened. So no, I don't think he should be deported because of what happened. Not everyone feels that you should stay in this country. What do you say to them? There's no point of running away from things if I can uh, try to make, make it better. Who doesn't want to be a part of this community who helps the fallen person too? Because I'm not a person who, who did this purposely or intentionally. I know people have lost their lives and I don't want to hide at the back. All I can do is stand in front of them and fold my hands and say sorry. With the paperwork filed in January, Jaskirat Sidhu's lawyer had expected a decision on deportation well before now. He says Jaskirat should learn his fate imminently.